Yes, it's Andy Hughes. It's um, May 8th. 6th, I think, is it? 7th? I think it's the 7th. It's, uh, May 7th, uh, 2017. I'm here with Gary Mormino, and uh, we're going to do a, an interview for the uh, Tampa Historical Society for the Sunland Tribune. Um, thanks for uh, thanks for sitting with us today. Um, Indeed. So, um, tell us a little bit about kind of just your background and how did you find your way to academia? It's an improbable story, uh, and, and as I've gotten older, I've I've kind of pinched myself. I mean, I did not come out of the conventional backgrounds. Uh, I don't think anyone. Who, who knew my situation would have said, this guy's destined to become a professor. Uh, uh, very working class family. My, uh, my father's side, uh, the Sicilian immigrants, my grandparents came to Napoleonville, Louisiana, 1906, to cut sugar cane. Uh, uh, there's a lot of room for upward mobility when you begin your life cutting sugar cane. I finally had a chance to go to that village, uh, and, and man, it's a desolate place, about an hour west of New Orleans. And I, I think about half the males of this community of Alia in Sicily left for Texas, Louisiana, places like that. And, uh, and somewhere around 1916, they heard of opportunities in the St. Louis area. I, gosh, I'd do anything to go back and, and interview them uh, because my the oldest of the uncles, Angelo, was born on the hill in St. Louis. Ironically, that figures later into my background. But the family legend, and it could be true, is that that com community was predominantly Lombard, northern Italian. It's a famous Italian community in St. Louis, southwest St. Louis. And they claimed they were run out of the community. The northern Italians didn't like the southern Italians. And, but that, if that's true, I don't understand. There's a kind of missing link. I've always been told they left because there was jobs in these oil refineries. But they wound up in a little community of Wood River, Illinois, two words, uh, across the river from St. Louis, a uh, town of about 10,000 entirely devoted to oil refineries. It was built for that purpose. Uh, the community, I think, had five oil refineries, if you can imagine that, that and the neighboring communities. The, the community surrounding it, Alton, Illinois, Madison, had two or three steel mills, Grand City. Uh, there was, in East Alton, a, a uh, place that made ammunition. There was a paper mill. I mean, it's just astonishing. Uh, this was a dream setting for my uncles and my father, largely uneducated. These were union jobs, pretty decent jobs for for that era. Very, very much a union town as well. Uh, my father always told me that my ass would be royally kicked if anyone ever told him I crossed a, a picket line. Um, but anyway, the, so my grandparents moved to Wood River, uh, six uncles born there, two aunts, and my grandfather was a, a bricklayer for Standard Oil Refinery. The legend always passed down is that every day he took home a brick in his lunch pail. And one day they had a checkpoint. And the guard says, why are you stealing a brick from Mr. Rockefeller? He worked for Standard Oil. And my grandfather said, I want to show my sons what I do. And the family legend is 30 years later he had enough bricks to build a house. <laughs> that the house was built of wood is immature. <laughs> it's tradition. So anyway, uh, I don't think any of my, my father, any of his uncles got through high school. My father was a fourth grade dropout. Education was not valued. Um, my father always thought I needed my ass kicked. I should join the army at 18 and get a little discipline. And that at 38, or for age 48, 30 years later, I could have a pension, and um, he made, I mean, we, uh, it was a very, I, I also grew up in a very large family, we had uh, six, there were six siblings, and it was very well known that there was no money for college, that, that I mean, uh, they were, I mean, I don't know how they made it, I mean, really, so uh, 
but he took me. It's interesting. Uh, one year they, the one year they allowed the sons of refinery workers to work for the summer. These were union jobs. I mean, this was three or four times what you get a root beer stand. So my my father got me that job, and then he got me another job. We went to. You had to see the city councilman. To get, this was a state job. Big John Stepanovich, about three hundred and fifty pounds, and he and my father talking and. I think some money was exchanged, and I got a job working for the Illinois State Highway Department. And to put it in perspective, in those days, I I figured if I could save a thousand dollars in the summer, have a thousand, I could get through with with no debt. I mean that the man the tuition was I had scholarships. I went to this little school, Millican University. To, to get back to your original question, my mother's side of the family, they were they were more respectable. Had had an uncle do a little time in prison. <laughs> Doesn't everyone have an uncle who spent? A, and uh, the first, by the way, the first time I ever remember meeting him, he was coming back from the Korean War. Must have been about fifty three, and he had punched out an officer and was dishonorably discharged. <laughs> and this big party for Uncle Louis <laughs> coming back. My my last uncle just died, so all the mail, so that. Of that great migration. My mother's family is, they even had it tougher. I mean, my poor mother, oh, this poor woman. Her, she had a sister, and she was born in a coal mining community in southern Illinois, and um, the name was Dingle. Um, and clearly, I, I've, I've done a little research in this, uh, you know, she was born about two months after the wedding, <laughs> you know. You don't need to be a sociologist to figure out. And there were very, very bad blood between the Dingoes and the Marlows, the two sides of the family. And when my mother was two years old, her father was killed by her grandfather. You know, the bad, right? Oh, and wow. she was holding him, apparently, or he was holding her. So, my, you know, Great Depression. A burned out coal mining community. I mean, they had no, I mean, desperately poor. And then she, my, her mother married Phil Stasi. So I had two Italian grandfathers. And, and Phil was about as uh, colorful and disreputable as you can. He had a one, one arm um, and, and had a tavern. I had uh, several taverns in the family. Kind of interesting. And... Uh, uh, Phil did a little book on the side and everything, but but he let me uh, work at his bar in the mornings. I'd stock up, so I had two or three jobs. I mean, going, I was desperate to get out of Wood River, right. really, really desperate to start a new life. I mean, I was such a loser in high school and insecure, and uh, thought I was going to be a chemist. Uh, I was absolutely certain I liked math and science. And then I got into college calculus and uh, figured, well, you know, I like history. I figured, well, I'll be a high school history teacher or something like that, right. which which would have been just, just fine in those days. So I, I went to school at Millikan University, M-I-L-L-I-K-I-N, um, uh, in, in Decatur, Illinois. Um, probably it was good for me. Uh, you know, but I, I, I was just so... It was, I wasn't undisciplined because I was a hard worker, but no one had ever set me down and told me about how to write, how to study. Right. This was one of the things so I had to kind of learn. Really, I, I didn't really bloom until graduate school. I, I was a good student at Millican, and I had some very gifted teachers who encouraged me to go on. And, and the reason I went on to graduate school at the University of North Carolina, I mean, no one does these things like this anymore. You know, you... Hello! Hi. Hello. Okay, so we left off with Millican. Okay, yes. And, and then uh, you're about to go to UNC. Well, and the, re the only reason I went to UNC, I, I absolutely clueless. I, I, when I, I talk to grad students today, I mean, people make these decisions very rationally. I like European history as much as American history, but no one ever sat me down and said, well, you got to do one or the other. And... Um, I had a very kind and, and very good professor named Robert Haywood, who was a big historian of Kansas, who was at Millican. And he had gone to UNC, and he said, you know, I think you'd like it. So sure, I applied. I, I think I was accepted at Colorado and Texas. And I wanted to get out of Illinois. 
Right. And and at the time, I didn't realize that I would also be married. Lynn and I got married uh, in 1969. And so, and so what year did you go to UNC? Okay, so I graduated in May of 69. We were married in June of 69. Okay. And after we came back from our honeymoon, we, we left. We had this little... Uh, well, we, Lynn, the, the first car I ever had was Lynn. Lynn had a Mal, Chevy Malibu, and we had a little trailer in the back with about two two square yards of belongings. And uh, so we arrive in Chapel Hill, most beautiful place I had ever seen. And I get my draft notice. I said, oh, man, you know, I, I, I was opposed to the war, but... Uh, you know, you're married, and figure, well, okay, maybe it, what maybe what I should do is go in officer's candidate school and get something out of it. And I, my logic was, you know, maybe they'll teach me Russian, and I'll come back and be a Russian historian. And I was this close to signing. If they had just, if he had just said, yes, we guarantee you language training. I was going to Navy intelligence office, and uh, he, he would not budge on that. Well, you know, someone of your, so... Uh, the next day, I'm at the UNC Union, and I see the thing about drafty for jobs. And I got a job, drafty for a job, training dogs for Vietnam. I had also been a psych major. I had thought about going in higher ed as an administrator. Now, and then, and you had, had you already worked at KFC at this point? No, I should go okay. back to KFC, yes. Right, well, we, we need to yeah, hear that uh, okay. just briefly. But. Okay, <laughs> I'll, I'll finish the uh, the draft deferred job. Right. And um, uh, I had I had not only been a psych major, I had worked at a mental hospital in Illinois. Uh, they, they were just opening this new mental hospital for juvenile delinquents in Illinois. These were really more delinquents than anything else but we had I, I spent my senior going into my senior year at uh, taking classes at the University of Illinois and it was all in behavioral psych which is what animal training is so I could have led this and, and uh, I, I've always wanted to know what happened to those poor dogs uh, maybe your father it saved your father's <laughs> life right. it's a the story's coming back but uh I did that for about six months until Nixon came out with the lottery, and my lottery pick was uh, high enough that I barely went under. But all all along, both in in, I mean, the one thing my my father gave me was was a work ethic. I mean, that man, nothing is going to be handed you. Uh, you know, you need to work, and so I worked first as a paper boy. I must have worked as a delivering morning and afternoon papers for six or seven years. And then I worked at a root beer stand. And the most interesting job was at Kentucky Fried Chicken, which uh, uh, was relatively new. This would have been 63, 62, 63. And this is where? In Wood River, Illinois. Wood River, okay. And uh, Kentucky Fried Chicken, I know, was being, the stock was over the counter at that time. It hadn't gone national. The, the colonel had sold the franchise to, I think, Hublin... But but he was the spokesper not spokesperson. He was the traveling brand. I mean, if you think, has there ever been a brand like the Colonel? I mean, I don't, I'm not sure there has. And as I've told you many times, uh, I come in after school one day, and I hear this cursing. I and I'd always heard through the managers that no one could curse like the Colonel. That he was. Like a sailor, and the manager's name I even remember his name, Lanny Dar. He, like poor Lanny, who was the brother-in-law of the owner of the place. <laughs> oh God! And then after he reamed Lanny out, he saw me and was rather kind to me. Actually, came up, uh, said, "Son," he said, uh, "Would you show me the gravy?" And I'd also heard that the colonel, the one thing that just drove him crazy about the new owners is they they shortchanged the gravy. And we made gravy. It was like these, must have been six gallon soup uh, uh, pans. And, and you'd simply pour this little thing of, it looked like plaster of Paris, and everything would coagulate. And you then threw the, the chicken skin cracklings in to make it interesting. And he took one bite and ordered me to throw it out. And he goes back and yells at Landy Dark some more. And then he sits me down. And uh, gosh, I wish I had had a videotape of this. He said, son, have you, I'm 16 years old. Have you considered a career? 
with Kentucky Fried Chicken. And I said, you know, I, I really wanted to go to college. And he got, he wasn't mad as he was just uh, upset. And he says, you know, son, you just walked away from a million dollar deal. And I've often wondered, you know, those at that, the stock options you would have had then, he may have been right. Now you would have died at age 45 uh, <laughs> of the, the the chicken vapors in Greece. But, uh so you really worked your way up. And, but... and then in, in college, gosh, I worked at the admissions office, and I was a uh, I worked at a sorority clearing tables. Right. Figured it would also get dates. That really didn't happen. But um, and what else? Did I, always in the summer. I uh, always had. Jo- I mean, uh, you just couldn't have imagined not, not doing that. So, uh, but the whole thing of going to grad school was. So I was so unprepared uh, academically. I mean, just what it required, the idea that you're supposed to seek an advisor and you, you go to a school because that school had certain strengths. And, and, you, and, and I was lucky UNC strength was Southern history uh, and uh, had some wonderful professors there. But the irony of ironies, my advisor was a Millican graduate. A guy wow. named Roger Lachin, uh, a, a, I, I, about two years ago, I, he retired. He, he was at UNC for 49 years, wow. and he taught a year of high school, so he was a 50-year man. He had been an All-American basketball player at Millican, and then he went to the University of Chicago, but his field was urban history. And um, he, and, and his real field, I mean, he did a lot of studies of California cities, but he instilled in me the idea of you know getting to know a city, walk a city. Uh, he liked the idea of interviews and things like that. So, um, you know, uh, I I got better in graduate school as I learned the game. I, I still remember the first paper I got back was passive voice with three exclamation. I had no idea what passive voice was. So I, you know, um, I don't think I was a very good writer, but I worked very hard to become, I think, a, a decent writer. Right. So uh, it was all, and, and Chapel Hill was the most wonderful place. Uh, wow. And, and all I have to do is return there, even after a long drive, just walking that beautiful quad is soothing and relaxing. All right. Well, what a contrast to yes. where you come from. Exactly, right? yeah. And I, I, I think that's what... Yeah, I, I, one of my sisters became a nun, and I've often thought that was the house and the, the city was so noisy, the factory whistles and the smell and the family, the eight in the family, that I always thought she, she saw the sanctuary right. of silence there. All right. Um, so what other uh, inspirations did you have when at UNT? You just talked about your advisor who sounded like he was influential. Well, the, the the faculty there was a man named George Brown Tyndall. Well, I mean, a legend. I mean, I, you know, his text is still being used. Uh, his wife's name was Blossom, bow tie wearing, but just uh, demanded. He was the first really to demand good writing, and he had these like Ten Commandments: Thou shalt not use passive voice. Right. And he had these things that you never. You, you must find the full name. It's not you know. Andy L. Hughes, it's, you know, Lawrence or whatever. Oh, uh, right. Yeah, and, uh, but uh, he's the one, even though I was not his student, uh, and I've often wondered, he uh, he tried to talk me into writing a dissertation on the history of tourism in North Carolina, particularly in the West. And I've often wondered, had I fought, done that, whether I would have wound up doing North Carolina history. Right. Um it was also a time when the profession was changing. Prior to 1969, I mean, anyone who came, came out of grad school got a job because schools were just exploding everywhere. The baby boom, people who traditionally didn't go to college. And I remember in, the, in the, like May of 1970, which was interesting, uh, Kent State, they closed the campus right. out. And uh, the chair of the department called all the first year grad students. So we were just finishing our first year and he was holding letters. He says, gentlemen, and I think there was one woman in the room. Uh, he said, the, the, bar, the, the great feast is over. 
uh, I'm getting these letters that the job market is drying up. For the first time he could remember, people weren't getting jobs. And he said, uh, listen, you, you all have only put a year in. I cannot encourage you to, to go on. But if you'd like to, that's good. But, you know, be prepared. Wow. And I, I went out, took the law, law board's test without even opening the book and got on the waiting list at UNC. And, but I decided, you know, I was, Lynn's working. She, she fortunately was able to transfer her job there in Social Security you know, give it another year. And each year I liked it a little better and became a grad assistant there. Um, I'm trying to think of some of the other. And then, well, also, like, what are you reading at this time? Is there something that, you know, you came across a text that really kind of you inspired you? Know, it was you? Uh, it was an exciting period to be a young historian. The the kind of history from the bottom up was just coming. There was right. a guy named there named Don Matthews, a, a, a stray. Uh, he had actually been one of Ray Arsenault's professors at Princeton. And he was there, uh, a strange guy. He uh, <laughs> he had a an expensive French wolfhound that he would only speak French to <laughs> in commands. But he was the first to really get into the the new social history they were calling it right. that that you you know look and say and that really attracted me and uh uh gosh i mean uh Zinn, howard zinn came to campus uh right. so it was an exciting period there was also really good literature on slavery my gosh i mean every year you were um and i remember there was a guy there named hugh leffler who was mr north carolina he was probably 75, and, and a bunch of us were studying for written. That they, they really took that seriously in those days, your written and orals. Mm -hmm. And he was saying that when he graduated from Harvard, I think he said it was 1915. This would have been 55 years later, so that's about right. That he said he could truthfully say he had read every important book in American history. You could actually do that. Right. Today, I, seriously, even by the time I was graduating, I'm not sure you could do that in some subfields like slavery. And now, you, you uh, and, and so that was another thing that was changing, the sheer volume right. of material coming out. Um, you, you weren't seeing yet, you, you were just seeing, at, by the time I left, people specializing. Mm -hmm. And one of my great regrets is the year I left... Uh, Hall, Jackie Hall came. She said she was kind of a high priestess of oral history, particularly civil rights. I've often thought, and in fact, one of the guys in my class stayed. He became director of history at Smithsonian. Mm. He was the uh, he he was doing one of the first oral history, and then he got a job as director of the North Carolina Humanities Council, and then Smithsonian. Brent Glass is his name. Mm. So. Uh, uh, eventually, I think everyone got jobs. A few people decided not to stay in the profession. And um, in 1974, I was ABD, all but dissertation. Uh, and actually, I should explain. I decided to write my dissertation on Italians in St. Louis. You know, again, looking back at not rational decision, I've been very lucky. So, these kind of gut decisions have, have worked out. And so in 1973... Well, I mean, how what, what, explain, yeah, how was it sort of a haphazard decision? You know, I think I read an article in Time magazine about this place that I had never been to. It was 20 miles from my house. Right. One, I think one of the most famous Italian communities. We just didn't get around much. I mean, right. I, I, I hardly knew St. Louis other than the, the ballpark and downtown. And I said, well, you know, that might be interesting. And, you know, do a term paper on it. Um, so the, the I, I finally got to see the place and research. It was the summer of 73. I got a fellowship at Newberry Library. It was on the new family history. And uh, uh, kind of interesting spending some time there. And I was going to spend the rest of the summer, about three months, on the hill. 
Lynn and I, Lynn, so we moved there. I'll never forget the first time I drove up to the hill. It was early morning, probably June, July, 1973. And uh, this big guy, I mean, huge guy, a t-shirt. I found out later he was kind of a vigilante squad. The hill was surrounded by some bad neighborhoods. And he said, uh, I said, excuse me, is this Dago Hill? <laughs> he walks over and said, son, you better be Italian. <laughs> <laughs> but that's what all the locals called it, Dago Hill. Um, so I get to St. Louis and I figure, okay, where do you go? What's your first place? Well, you go to the archives. And the St. Louis Historical Society had this incredible archives in the public library downtown. I, I, oh, they had one downtown, and they had one, the Missouri Historical Society, in Forest Park. I go, I go I'll go. never forget this. You can't make this up. I go there, and uh, I write my name, and she said, well, we have a tradition here. You need to go say hello, kind of get your blessing from this little lady who was kind of, she had a blanket on her. She was about 85 years old. She was one of the survivors of the Titanic. Oh, wow. <laughs> I go over and introduce myself, and... And then she said, what are you studying? I said, Italians in St. Louis. She said, why would you want to study that? <laughs> but she still can. Okay. But the, the archives had nothing. I mean, when I say nothing, they had a couple articles from Italians in, in the early 19th century. But this was a very elitist organization. They were interested in French fur trappers and the first fathers of St. Louis. Right. And I'm thinking, I've, I've got... A lease for three more months in my apartment in St. Louis, and I'm thinking, what the hell am I going to do? And what you know, I'd spend about half the day. This is where I developed my my great avocation of reading newspapers on microphone. Except in those days, there was no you could you could copy something, but it took a week for you to get it back, and they copied the entire page. It was like three dollars. So I mean, I had mounds of note cards and. I'd spend three or four hours, and it was also non, well, it was by hand, right? by hand, uh, the levers and everything there. And, and this is when you began your, your note card no, fixation, Note cards, right? exactly, note cards, and, and I'm finding a little stuff, I'm thinking, okay, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to return and say, okay, I made a mistake, and I need to find a better topic, with, uh, and, but I've still got three months, so I figure, well, you know, why not talk to the people in the neighborhood? <laughs> and uh, so I bought a cheap tape recorder. And anyone who looked like over 60 years old, I would go up and say, could we talk? And I mean, I must have done 100 interviews that summer. And including, if, if I had had some videotapes, some of the most remarkable interviews I've ever done. This one lady, um, gosh, she must have been close to 90. She said, sure. She said, I'll bring some friends you could talk to as well. So there were three or four women, each about 90 years old. They were telling me about an event that took place about 1900. This is 1973 now. And she said they, they lived in this small community in Lombardy named, uh, called Cugiono, C-U-G-G-I-O-N-O. And there's a knock at the door, and there's a woman there they don't know, and the mother tells them to go to their room. And... The woman uh, is basically proposing that her son marry this woman's daughter, but they had never met. And she's kind of a marriage broker. And she, she said, Am I a son? He's a big shot in America. He works for the railroad in the St. Louis. And um, I think it would be nice if your daughter marry my son in America. And they, they would bargain. They said, Well, what do you have to bring to this marriage? Well, we have a mule and some linens, and they had, you know, a, a mulberry tree, and then they, they then they called the daughter out and told her, great news, you're going to be married next month in, in St. Louis, and the woman showed her a picture of her fiancé, who had kind of a, a store-bought suit and a gold tooth, and the four women all were, they called them picture brides, because they'd only seen pictures of their future, because all the young men, like my grandfather's generation, Went, went there to work, and if, if you went back, it would take you, you'd lose two or three months of your life, you'd right. spend a lot of money, everyone trusts their mother, right? And <laughs> uh, 
They all went with a chaperone on a ship to New York Railroad to St. Louis. At the train station, they met their fiancés and were married the next morning. I mean... (laughs) And and divorce is unheard of. Because right. You, because you're not marrying for well, love. Well, they, yeah, they don't give you much time to really think it over. Anyway. <laughs> no, no. You're marrying for survival. I right. mean, if if you're a young woman in Italy at this time, all the young men are America. So if you if you don't marry an an Americano is what they call them, you entered the convent, and if you were the youngest daughter, you were the old maid. You took care of the older relatives. So this is, you know, it became kind of a, and, but I talked to some mobsters, oh my, I mean, it was just amazing. And uh, really, totally unmethodological. Okay. I, you know, I, I've read a lot of the books about oral history, and they, they really bore me. I, to right. me, oral history, what I want out of it is a, some good stories that, that will make a more colorful book. I'm not interested in the academic nature of oral history, and and I yes I understand they may not be telling the truth, and I can check this out. But to me it was, and also getting to know the community, right? And that's that, and so, so uh, I did a book on on the it was called Immigrants on the Hill, uh, by Italians in St. Louis, right? And the circle comes around George Tyndall. I met him at at the journal at the conference of Southern historians, and he said, "You know, how's it going?" I'm. I think I'd been at USF for a few months, and I said, "You know, good. I I really kind of looking for a publisher." And he said, "I know a very good friend, uh, whose name I've forgotten, at the University of Illinois Press. He was kind of a legend. University of Illinois was a big time press, and." That's how, how it happened. I got the, the book published by University of Illinois. Right. Uh, and it came out in 86. So I'm not at, in Tampa yet, but yes, go ahead. Right, okay. Um, no, that's, and well, so and with this first project, really, you kind of establish, I guess you could say a triad, you know, the oral history, Mm-hmm. Archives, newspapers. Yes, exactly. Right. And the hill, the hill was so different than Ybor City. Right. It, uh, religion was the cornerstone there. In fact, it, it's interesting. Uh, there was a priest there. I think he was in the article that got me interested in the hill. His name was Salvatore Polizzi. Okay. And he was called kind of the gorilla priest. He was... In 1970 or 73, he was one of the 100 most influential young Americans, you know, under age 40. And he had been born in St. Louis. And and it seemed like everyone on the Hill wanted their daughter to be a nun. And and the community, there was no reason for the Hill to still be standing. Most communities like the Hill had been bulldozed over. The, The housing was not superior housing. It was kind of in a not a great area of St. Louis, surrounded by some, some uh, areas, but it was a community. And that's the other thing that that I really honed was what is a community? Everyone seemed to want it. Why, why can't the federal government create communities? Right. They 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 don't do a very good job. In fact, no one seems to. It has to kind of come. And Polizzi in the church, what he did, uh, he. And the government wanted to build an interstate highway through the community. And and they did, but he got them to put an overpass. But that galvanized the community in mm-hmm. the early 70s. And he creates this organization called Hill 2000. We have to think about the future. And he said, I want everyone in the community to agree that if you sell your house, you will sell it to the Hill 2000 nonprofit. We promise you you will get top dollar. You can even work with us here. We want to ensure that the new families are the right fit. That that, that doesn't simply mean white. We'd like to get Italians, but we want people committed. Are you willing to coach soccer? Are you willing to do Meals on Wheels? It's not enough simply to like the community. I love the restaurants and the amb- right. ambience. And there was a place called Rose's Bocce Court at a tavern. 
with an arbor of grapes growing over it. Oh my God! I mean, it, 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 the hill is just and and he more than anyone else saved the community. I think. I mean, he really did. And I, from the first time we met, I got off on the wrong foot. He he. I think he saw me as an interloper. That he knew a lot more about this, and and he was suspicious, and I could never get him on my side. But I and but I say wonderful things about him, and ironically, the book wins the this prize from the American Catholic Historical Society. I, I talked to all the other, I mean, they're bishops, archbishops, and uh, so the book is about to be published. I the the, the and the the guy from the press, University of Illinois Press, sends. I had also interviewed Yogi Berra and Joe Garagiola. Mm -hmm. There's a chapter on the hill, on sports in there. And, and Garagiola liked it so much, he was telling me, you know, maybe I can get you on the Today Show. And, but unbeknownst to anyone, he sends it to Polizzi saying, you know, I bet you'd like to see this. Well, then I get a call from the publisher. He's saying, got bad news. Uh, the priest w demands that you delete a chapter in the book. <laughs> There's a chapter called A Still on the Hill about prohibition. Everyone I interviewed, everyone was eager to talk about prohibition. It seemed like there must have been a, a bootleg still in everyone's basement. But it did not lead to dysfunction, crime. Uh, it, it led to upward mobility. People used it to, often what they would do in the early days, your first home would be the basement. My, my uncle had a place like it. it was just a basement with a flat roof about three feet above the ground. And if you had money later, you built a floor on top of that. Well, the, it, and, and they, seemingly they weren't even drinking the stuff. You know, they'd have their Chianti and things. But uh, so it was rather kind of a positive aspect of the community. I mean, people had these wonderful anecdotes of... Uh, People buying a ton of chicken grains, telling them it was for the farm, and uh, so I, there's no way I'm going to delete the chapter. And so he said, "Well, you know, good luck uh, uh, when you return to the hill." So, you know, and and it's interesting, by the way, a footnote here. So we, I, I haven't seen him since, but I gave a talk about two years ago on the hill. This group invited me back. And many of the, the children of the people I interviewed were there. And someone comes up with a note that said, Father Polizzi would like to talk. Here's his phone number. And I feel terrible. I, I never called him. Uh, I still yeah. have it. I, I think I'm, I am. I'd love to talk to him. Uh, yeah, uh, he'd he probably like to hear the, that my sister's a nun. <laughs> um, but, um, but that, you know, unfortunate. Uh, right. And I don't know if I learned a lesson there. The, the lesson is you... you Probably that you need to be a part of the community. Right. You know, I was never, I, I lived there and everything, but my, I, it was an end, a means toward it, toward an end. Right, well, and, and sure, sure, you had a, a goal you were trying to accomplish, but interesting. So but, the hill is always, uh, uh, there's a soft spot in my heart. I mean, it, absolutely. it couldn't have been a better, turned out a pretty good topic. So and then, so how do we get you to USA? Well, I'm teaching, at, 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 also about this time, 1974, Milliken calls UNC, and, and the, the guy there I knew said, listen, someone's on sabbatical. Would you like to come for one year? Well, Lynn's from Decatur, Illinois. Uh, everyone, the warning was, you should never take an ABD job, all but dissertation. Everyone says, yeah, sure, I'll finish and uh, and it's two hours from St. Louis, uh, so so I did that, and the guy came back. But in the meantime, that first year, first year, there's a great story, by the way. It's uh, the, my first final examination. This would be in December 1974. I'm finishing the first class. Nixon's resigned. It's kind of an interesting time. I tell the class. I said, I've got great news for you. My wife is pregnant. And uh, she had just found out. And afterwards, three uh, co-eds come up. And they said, haven't you read, oh, what's the name of the book? It's The Population oh, Explosion. Right. <laughs> uh, uh, 
they said, and they they were indignant. How could you bring up a child in this world today? And they, oh my God, get a life, <laughs> girls. Are you? I mean, just. And what's funny about it is, about twelve years ago, the author was appearing here. Okay. And I went up and told him that story. He got the best kick out of it. He said, you know, I don't think they read the book carefully. But <laughs> right. I wasn't telling people, stop having babies. <laughs> right. But at any rate, uh, so uh, what happened? So uh, June came. The job's over. Uh, Lynn delivers in July. So I spent a year babysitting Amy and finishing the dissertation. I mean, this was a world that's, when I think back, if I had had today's world with the coffee shops, I mean, I mean, I mean, I had no car, there was nowhere to go, even if I wanted to take the stroller. Uh, I mean, I had a radio. Um, Decatur was, it was interesting, it's kind of the apogee of Decatur. Decatur had been a very prosperous blue-collar community. They had... Uh, little steel, but lots of industries. Man, it's bottomed out right. since then. Um, and then I, I taught, uh, I taught the third, so I taught my first and third years, but I don't think there was ever any optimism on my side that this was going to be permanent. I was, right. and, and it's hard. I mean, the first salary I made was 9000 a year in 1971, and in 1970. Six, I made twelve thousand, thirty-three percent. But that's still, I mean, kids were getting jobs in high schools at fifteen. Right. Uh, but we liked it. We bought a house. We had two children, uh, back to back. Um, and I'm thinking, you know, I I even applied for a policeman's job there, and wow. and I think I was about to take my physical exam, and I'd been to a conference in Atlanta where I met. Uh, the guy I was telling you about, and I interviewed at the University of South Florida. It was the only job I interviewed for mm. in those days, and it was a job they wanted someone in immigration. I think it's the only job I ever saw that they wanted someone in immigration. Mm. I was finishing my degree in June, right? And so that was lock set. John Belovic was on the uh, was on the committee, and um, so they asked me to come back to campus. I must have come back in June of 70, no, probably May in 77, got the job offer and uh, told Milliken we'd be leaving. And luckily, we just sold our house easily enough. Right. And uh, so we came, we arrived in, uh, in Tampa, I think, and I arrived about 10 days before Lynn and the kids. I drove down. I probably told you the, the barbershop story before. So my, I'm down here. In those days, we were in the quarter system. Classes didn't begin till late September. So I arrived. At, I, the reason I know it was August. Elvis had died in, in, in transit. Mm, I was okay. in Chattanooga. Waitress was in tears. And she said, <laughs> honey, the king has died. <laughs> so I get here. Uh, we're uh, this bought a place in Temple Terrace. And I badly needed a haircut. And on 56th Street, newly opened Temple Terrace Barber College. So I go there, and there are three students, uh, kind of pimply 17-year-olds, and about a 65, 70-year-old guy with a Van Dyke beard. And the guy says, you choose. And I, the old guy, okay. So he's, he's humming a little Italian opera as he's cutting my hair. And I'm thinking, now this is weird. Why would... <laughs> so at the end, I said, please don't think I'm being n nosy, but why, why would you at your age think about barber college and he said honest to God I just retired from 40 years of teaching at the University of Tampa and my pension is so bad I need I need extra income oh, I'm about to start my career oh. and <laughs> I wrote this up years later I think it was my 30th year in 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 Tampa mm -hmm. I wrote it in Leland's column but I never got the guy's name. And three of his students wrote me and said, you've answered our question. He, we, we, we were walking by Wolf Brothers, a, a downtown men's store, and they, it was a kind of upscale men's store, and we noticed that our former music professor was cutting hair. <laughs> we were thinking, 
what's going on? Right. <laughs> you don't associate those two things. And uh, so anyway, uh, I... Now, were you aware of Ybor City before you no, got to No, I had never heard of it. I did look at a few articles in those days, and I'm quite positive. I said, why Ybor City? It sounds interesting. Knew nothing about it. Right. I'd love to know what, how I even found out about it. No, no, what about Florida? I mean, nothing. It was right. I, I, I had uh, classmates who came to Florida during spring break. Uh, never came, uh, just out of off my radar screen that, that you could do this. Even at UNC, which specialized in Southern history, I can't ever recall. Florida being mentioned, right? So I mean, it, you'd, blank slate would be too kind, <laughs> um, but I think you know uh, they say Ybor City sounded interesting right. from from what I knew about it. Uh, knowing Spanish would have been really helpful in, in hindsight, but right. But you 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 had Italian though, right? Yes, I had Italian, and uh, so most of the research on the. Illinois book or the uh, Hill book was finished and I think my first day in Tampa I, I went to see Tony Piso I, I swear it was the first or second day who and I can't remember someone gave me his name I can't remember how that came about but regardless uh, he couldn't have been nicer right um, and uh, you know looking back at it uh, I'm a very lucky man I mean things kind of fell in place well, and you didn't have a father or Salvatore experience with no, someone like no, Tony, which would have no. been really bad. And that's what I mean. It's also the un the unhill uh, there. It, it, the hill religion was the cornerstone here. It was almost an annoying uh, institution. Right. Uh, there, there was no labor movement. And there, there was also no documents. Here, you had documents. Right. So, um, but at the time. Very few people had studied Ebor. Uh, there was this guy named Durwood Long, right. who I think I met once at a conference. Okay, and I've always been curious why he didn't do a book. He was a very good historian. Well, and he wrote several chapters. I mean, he must have had a couple hundred pages already done, just if you strung those chapters together. Right, right. And and I, he became a college president. Well, I think that's what happened. He got sucked into admin. administration, right. and and he also had some sexual lawsuits, I think. Oh, and he died probably about ten years ago. Wow, he was at Sangamon State, ironically, thirty so, miles from Decatur. So you became aware of that writing then? Yes, because he and, was he did this in the late '60s, right? Yeah, yeah. And okay. uh, I'm trying to. Gosh, we're. I'm not sure there was anything else in English. Uh, a, a woman named uh, Gloria Jehoda did a couple books at that time. Ebor's casually mentioned. Okay. Um, so, what happened though? The, I probably would not have studied Ebor had it not been for one of my UNC buddies, George Pazetta. Right. George was about. Very interesting. Uh, George Pozzetta and David Colburn arrived a year before me. Both of them had been Marine captains in Vietnam. Now, how many Vietnam vet professors have you known? Right. I mean, seriously, I bet you can name them on one hand. Very few. Uh, I mean, you just, that wasn't a route Vietnam vets took. But they, these guys were smart, and they, they, they were both married, had kids, and clearly, and they also had master's degrees. And clearly, they were there. What's the quickest way from point A to point B? I mean, we've we're, we're ready to move on with our lives, and uh, you, they they they're also very disciplined, being being captains, and saw some serious combat too, by the way. But George was studying New York Italians. Now, he was at UF. He, he would no, he was at UNC. Oh, I'm sorry, I right? And. Um, when, again, an unlikely place for both of us to be studying Italian immigrants. I mean, North Carolina may have had the fewest number of Italian immigrants in America. Uh, but we, we, were, we were there. And, and George and I became very close friends. And he, he got a job at the University of Florida. Uh, Mike Gannon hired him. And no, this is before or after? No, your... this is like 1970. 
Seventy one, seventy two. I I I arrived in sixty nine and left in seventy four. Gotcha. And now I'll never forget David Colburn got a job at East Carolina. His David's wife's uncle was the road commissioner. Later became a U.S. senator in North Carolina, and so it got David a job there. And then there was a budget shortfall, and they had to let him go. And I'll never forget uh, last time I saw David at UNC. We we're having a cup of coffee. He was saying, I don't know what I'm going to do. He said, I've got two kids, and i got to get a job. And he said, I'm interviewing over the phone tonight with Florida. And, of course, not only did he get the job, he becomes provost. <laughs> he may have been the last person hired in in American history over the phone. You can't do that anymore. You have to have these forms. But what does that tell you? You know, this was the old days when you right. had pipelines, and UNC had a pipeline to UF. Uh Julius uh, Pleasance. I mean, these were these were stellar candidates. By the way, it worked right. out very well for them. But uh, so David and George were already there, and George was already starting. He had, he was a year or two into doing a history of Italians in Ybor City. Right. George did not have to say to say, "Let's do this together." I think George also realized we we were a really good team. I mean, a classic co-authorship. Yeah, yeah. I was a better stylist than George, but okay. George was a better analyst. He liked to look at, you know, the analysis, uh, where this fits into the big picture. I never really liked that. Right. Uh, and he knew I I had the ability to interview these people. I was here, so it made a formidable team. Right. Uh, and uh, so we got that book. I mean, it was back to back books. I should add, by the way, as you know. It's also a miracle we're even having this conversation. Uh, there, it was a very tense time in the history department. Uh, I, and, and again, I blame some of it on myself. I, I didn't understand the, this. Um, it was also an immensely talented department. That was one of the problems. Right. There was so much talent and so little money. And I didn't subscribe to some of the politics of the time, but and, and I foolishly, you know, I, I I could have I could have fit in better. Uh, but uh, when I came up for tenure the first time, I had contracts with the Hill Book, and it was in press what they called them. Right. And there had never really been anyone let go. I mean, if if you had a good teacher. And they, they definitely sent a message to me. Not, they, they turned me down the first time. They're, on a one to five, one being poor, five being good, I got a zero for research. Ouch. Yeah, which I had several articles, but uh, I, you know, I get the point uh, and everything. And, and technically, it wasn't turning me down. It was allowing me one more chance, right. which you had to do anyway. But but in hindsight, I, I could very easily have been let go. Right. They, they could have gone yeah. to the dean and say, listen, he's a loser. Right, well, you didn't have anyone to really I, I, kind I mean, of I, back you no, up No, I, I, I was powerless. I mean, absolutely right. powerless. Well, and, and do you think that some of your colleagues felt threatened, you know, because you kind of got into the Ybor no. City no. thing so quickly? No. Because, I mean, were they working on... There were other people working on Tampa stuff at the same time but, as you were? But it, it wasn't that I could right. have done it. I mean, that that I had friends who could have blocked their bed. No. Um, so it was just, in, in hindsight, un, unfortunate. Uh, it was not a happy place. Well, I, I don't know. Has it ever been? <laughs> but saying that, it was a good place for me. I right. mean, uh, I got those, I mean, two, two books, 87... 86 and 87 out. Both of them won national awards. Right. Interestingly. Um, yeah, I didn't realize I probably, they came out so close. And, and I never, you know, I interviewed, I think, one other place, but probably would have taken a better job just to get it. Now, when did you go to, to Sicily? That was, uh, yeah, thank you. In, in 1980. Okay. In 1980, I got a one year Fulbright. Fellowship to Sicily, uh, teaching. Now we, were, did you know you were going to write with George at this point? Yes. Okay, yes. so you had yeah. already planned on. Yeah. In okay. fact, George 
George was also going to be in Italy at that time in Florence. And I remember Lou Paris, one of the most talented people I ever knew, probably the best stylist. I don't know anyone who who writes more and better, but but Lou definitely was not back. And went, he said, "You're you're out of your mind taking the Fulbright." He said, "I, I oppose it." And you know, I was defiant. No, I'm going to take it. And why? Why wouldn't you take it? Uh, because he said you need to get your book out, and I said, you know, I need the research there. But regardless, uh, it no, and, and, and consequently, by the way, I got not a dime from the university. Typically, if you get a Fulbright, you yeah, get right. half your salary. I mean, it was, it was yeah, strange. It is what it is. Right. Now, power play. In retrospect, was it worth it? From the yeah, research point yeah, from the research point and also from the language point of view, my right. Italian was not that good, really. Okay. And and uh, from the uh, just you know, it's it's always been one of the highlights of my life, and I, I was able to get invaluable research both on the Hill Book and in Tampa wow, with yeah. the archives there. Um, 1980, 81 was an interesting year. It also, by the way, changed my path. I remember I, when I was in, uh, in 81, I would go in every week to the American Embassy Library in Rome. I mean, I mean, what a place to be, Rome, the Via Veneto. And it was a tumultuous year in Florida. This was a day you couldn't, you know, news. I'm, I'm a news hound. And you, you, everything's in Italian. And... Uh, so I'd go in and read the uh, Herald Tribune, International Herald Tribune, and Florida is in flames, it seemed. I mean, every uh, you had the race ride in Miami, you had the Haitian boat people, Marielle, and I'm thinking, wow, you know, Florida is, you know, I, Rome's a pretty nice place to be, but when I get back, when I, when I get these two books done, I think... I'm going to make a transition to Florida. And looking there, it seemed to me that at that time there weren't many people studying Florida, and that this is going to become a pretty important state. I always, when I give a talk, I always say, I I, I realize only at that time that the greatest story in my lifetime may be what was happening in Florida every day. And but I said, you know, I'll have tenure, and so if I write a book, I'm not going to write an academic book. I'm going to write a popular book. Right. So that was a very critical time, 80, 81. And I came up for tenure, I think, in 84. So that's really what the, the germ seed of Land of Paradise. A, 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 Land of Sunshine. Land yeah. of Sunshine, right, I'm right. sorry, yeah. Yeah. Land, yeah. Okay. Exactly. And then, so, and then you actually traveled to Santo Stefano, right? Santo Stefano. Oh, uh, everyone, everyone says Stefano, but Stefano <laughs> Stefan. to be. Uh, George and I went down there. Uh, we arrived... St. Joseph's Day, 1981. Mm. Uh, we, we had been in Palermo doing a little research. We took the bus there, and we stayed at a place called Hotel. That was It was so slow. Uh, Albergo means hotel in Italian. And How many people lived in the village? Uh, it was a couple thousand. Okay. And we, we, we were, Tony Pizzo gave us the name of the, the principal, the school principal. And he took both of us, took our arms, and we walked down the main street, and he would just kind of nod to people and saying the Americans have arrived and they knew who to come to <laughs> and they, they fed us well. And so we, we, we did uh, research at the church archives. This is where the uh, priest there is saying, oh, Mormino, Mormino. He said, I'm in Italian. He said, I believe there's a sister Mormino. Let me see if I can find her. And she comes and she's about four foot five. And my Italian was really good. I, this was, I was, had been there almost a year. You know, I spiel off five minutes of praise for Sicily and the name Mormino. And she says to me uh, in Italian, she said, uh, Aspetta. Uh, Mastica la lingua, non avera. Which says, you really chew up the language, don't you? <laughs> Sister, give me a break, man. It's cold. I'm hungry. And, uh, but we, uh, you know, and then uh, I'll never forget when we, when we, when we left, we, there was one bus a week that went to here, to Palermo. And it left at like 6 o'clock Sunday morning. 
And so George and I are waiting about 5.30 at the, at the uh, kind of the town square. And this old dilapidated Mercedes Benz pulls up. And this guy gets out of his car, goes to the center of the square, and urinates. Thinking, oh, love Sicily. Comes over, shakes her hand, of course. And he said, where are you guys going? And we're, you know, we're waiting for the bus. He said, where are you, where are you going? He said, well, Palermo. He said, you know, I'm going to Palermo. You, you need a ride? And George and I, Sure. And he goes in the next town and he does the same thing, picks up. And then we, we say, he's a taxi. We don't realize it. But what he does is go before the bus to these communities. Uh-huh. And it turns out he's very inexpensive taxi. <laughs> and he took us to Corleone and he had great stories along the way. And then I went back once on my own to do some more research there. You know, I haven't been back since 81. The other thing I'm curious about, too, is the Godfather. So, I mean, to think about, you know, you're, you're just getting into kind of immigrant history and everything. This must have had some kind of an effect. The movie, you mean? Right. Oh. I'm kind of just awareness of, of, like, Italian immigration. And, I mean, not just the mafia thing, but just the whole... Well, this was a, the time. I, I can remember in the UNC library looking at the headlines that there had been... Uh, the Italian Anti-Defamation League is organizing, and it's this period, period they call kind of the ethnic revival. The, the buttons, kiss me, I'm Italian, Ukrainian, Polish, and all this. Mm-hmm. And, and the Godfather was just one, you know, kind of the most spectacular example of this. Okay, right. And, you know, I met Mario Puzo in, in actually Durham. Uh, right before the publication, or before the movie. Okay. And, you know, this is, the, what, the 35th anniversary of the movie? Was it 72, 82, 92, or 40, 45th, maybe, anniversary. Right. Uh, but, I mean, you, it's hard to overestimate the impact of the book. But there was also the milieu as part of this. Uh, and then... The the sequel is even better than the original. I mean, it's right. uh, uh, people will be talking about this a hundred years. I mean, uh, and an unlikely combination. I mean, the, so unpredictable. It was not destined to be a hit. I mean, just you had some incredibly talented people there. Right, right. But it just yeah, it just seems like it would have. You know, there's before Godfather and after Godfather. Yeah. It's sort of like before Godfather. And I don't what, know. Is it is it really a, a And you know, one of my regrets and and I interviewed some people who were involved in corruption and everything. Right. I, uh John Bellavik and I used to have coffee every day at Fourth of July Cafe. And behind us was Santo's brother. And uh I I put out all sorts of markers. I'd do anything to interview Santo Traficante. I'll, I'll listen to his demands, what he wants. I really want to talk about the old days, not, not, and but never any luck. I did interview Danny Alvarez, if you want to hear that story. So I'm at the uh, La Tropicana in Ybor City. I used to see Roland Mantega there a lot, and uh, he was a big help. And and uh, means uh, Frank Orso, who was the president of the Firemen's Union in Tampa, comes up and. He says, Gary, how's the work coming? I said, pretty good. I said, you know, I'd, I, I, I'd really like to interview some guys, you know, uh, on the inside, in, in, uh, uh, the corruption. He said, get your coat, let's go. And he takes me to, I think it was Seminole Heights, where Danny Alvarez, a poor guy, just lost one of his legs to diabetes. But his story is worthy of a screenplay for someone. You can't, you can't make this up. His He's a young kid during the Spanish Civil War, and his father is obviously very, you know, uh, supporting the, the Republican side. And the day Franco took over, triumphed, the father comes home, gives his sons hugs, which he thought was unusual, goes back, shoots his boss, who's a Franco sympathist, and then c- kills himself. And this poor kid is essentially an orphan, and he gets a job at a Seminole Heights drugstore run by Curtis Hickson, who becomes a city councilman. And Alvarez, I think, may be the first Latin policeman there. And Hickson brings him on as his bag man. And he's telling me, making these during elections, he'd say, you know, I'd get 100, 200 uh, uh, 
pickups. And I said, you mean dollars? He said, no, hundreds of thousands. And he said he'd take money to Tallahassee. I mean, uh, just amazing stuff. But uh, interviewed Nick Nuccio three times. He was he would always dress up. And the poor man, if he ever had money, he took illegally. He was hiding it because he would put on a suit and he had holes that malls had eaten. <laughs> and, uh, but uh, I'd, I'd go down to Ybor City t twice a week often, go to the Italian club, Cuban club, and there would always be people there in those days uh, uh, having coffee. I don't think anyone ever turned me, the only guy who turned me down was the crazy man at the uh, El Pasaje. Okay. Um, right. Jose Avenal. Uh, who, <laughs> right. Who obviously wouldn't talk, but um, I was also very lucky. You know, I, I, interestingly, UN, USF did not have an oral history program at that time. Right. UF uh, gave me the tapes, and uh, they. I don't think they transcribed all of them. Eventually, I think USF did right. some, but very lucky to have UF and and. With, with Sam Proctor there, right. but um, looking back at you know where we got the energy to do all this, I mean, right. uh, but we're also very lucky. Uh, the other the other thing that ca that cannot be underestimated is is special collections. Um, Jay was there, Jay Dobkin, mm -hmm. and I don't know if Jay had any great interest in Ebor, but was willing to support it and. Uh, probably changed the direction of the special collections when we got the Piso and the Hampton Dunn collections. Absolutely. Those were huge, right. to, to say the least. Um, and then Glenn Westfall should be given credit for bringing in the, uh, what's the name of the collection, the, scar, uh, the guy from New Jersey. Right, Osterweil, uh, it was Osterweil, Botts, um, Kane uh, Greenberg. Kane, yeah, yeah, uh, Kane. Yeah. Those are the big ones, yeah. yeah. Um, uh, I mean, uh, and Steve I, Lawson and I said, a lot yeah, of the, the civil, civil rights stuff. So I mean, looking back at it, the the real story is just the synergy between the history department and special collections. Wow, I mean, the Nancy Hewitt, the work. I mean, right. you know, here was a city. I think when when we all arrived, this was a very understudied city. That's just you, it, you, and this whole gen, it's, this well, whole generation of scholarship that you guys produced really. Well, is... and also you think about the next generation. The you've got those archives of the clubs in right. uh, there now. Right, it's huge. Uh, it wasn't the most harmonious group. I mean, you know, Susan Greenbaum. I don't know if Susan ever said a kind word to me. I mean, just <laughs> yeah, the one who actually introduced her to the people that Cuba just. But at any rate, uh, it was right. Well, uh, it was. It was. But you know, you think about oh yeah, you, Susan, Lou Perez, Lou Perez, um, Nancy Hewitt, Nancy Hewitt, of course. Uh, you had Snyder in uh, American Studies and Jack right. Moore, somewhat. Right, and uh, uh, and Glenn. Yeah, Glenn. Glenn. I mean, wow. Right, and we're we're probably leaving right a, a few out. I mean, it's pretty amazing. Yeah. Yeah, Bob Kirstein. Uh, yeah, Bob Durbin arrived. Uh, exactly. Bob and I arrived the same year. Bob was in St. Louis when I was in St. Louis. Wow. We, we didn't know one another. Okay. Yeah. How interesting. Yeah. Well, you know, I, I know that we we haven't covered everything here, but I think we've done a good job for a first chapter. <laughs> I've enjoyed it. Because yes. uh, but we really appreciate it. Thank you, Gary. Indeed. Rock on. <laughs>